All right. Hi, everybody. Uh, International Master David Proust here once again. Uh, we're going to be looking at the second game of the Carlson Anon World Championship match from today. And uh, the match is getting exciting right from the beginning. Um, the big question to me when I was lying in bed sleeping tonight was, is Carlson going to play e4, d4, c4, knight f3? Um, I kind of had the feeling that Anand would try d4 this match. But for Carlson, it was kind of like hard to say because um, he's a little bit all over the place. But finally, I figured that he would probably go e4. Just at least find out right away what defense is Anand planning to play against e4. And um, immediately, the game goes into Carlson's favorite opening, as we talked about yesterday, the Rui Lopez. Um, and uh, I'm sure he was happy to see it. I mean, the way I'm happy to see the King's Gambit, he must be happy whenever he gets the Rui Lopez. So let's have a look at this game. Here we are. All right. So, um, got the moves entered in here already. So we go straight into the Rui Lopez and uh, Knight F6 from Anand. And that's the Berlin defense. And uh, the main line of it lately, or by lately I mean over the last 13 years, ever since Kramnik brought this into world championship play against Kasparov. The main line has been the famous Berlin endgame, which goes like this. Black takes the pawn on E4. White plays D4 trying to blow up in the center, and then after knight d6 attacking this bishop, the most common variation we get goes like this, and white trades queens. Then you get this endgame. This is the Berlin endgame that's so famous ever since uh, Kramnik drew Kasparov with it several times. Um, really the key factor in him winning that world championship match in 2001 in London. Um... So that's the Berlin defense. Um, Carlson himself is quite a good player of it. And uh, it was seen in their world championship match last year. Um, last year, Anand played this defense as well. Um, but at a point where... Uh, at a point where Carlson was already ahead enough in the match that he purposely went for like a super drawing variation with just rookie one and just trading pieces like this. He played one of these variations and just traded all the pieces on the e-file. Um, and it was very, very boring. It was the boring game of the match, definitely. It was that uh, Berlin. So um, now here, after knight f6, Carlson's move, what move does he go for? Um, one option is for him to go for the end game, I think, to castle and play the d4 variation, right? Um, I think right here. Now, why would Carlson go for this variation? Well, because Carlson loves end games and he's really good at end games. So we could expect him to go for this end game. I think last year they only had one game which actually went into this end game and it was the game where Anand was white and Carlson was black. And it was like a super fantastic, exciting game where Anand sacrificed a pawn on A2 and then got a big initiative and it was just really complicated fighting all game long. One of my favorite games of the match. Um, so one option for, Carl for Carlson is to go into this end game. He loves end games. He knows this end game pretty well. He plays it pretty well. The other option and what Carlson went for this game is D3. Now, d3 just preserves more tension by defending e4, so preventing any immediate simplification. And what it aims for is a longer, slower, maneuvering kind of game. Uh, more of a standard closed Rui Lopez. And that's what Carlson goes for here. And, you know, to me, it's like a little bit of a hard choice for Carlson since he likes both. He loves a long maneuvering Rui Lopez, and he loves him a good endgame. I think, however, that this D3 move makes the most sense as Carlson's choice and was a good choice. The reason is this. If you go into that endgame, 
yes, it's an end game, but it's an end game that your opponent studied, right? It's not like you play out the opening, then you find a way to sort of transpose into some end game, and then you both have to play um, for yourselves, um, which is a strategy that Carlson used in another game last year that was an important game. Let's see if I can just call this up for a second. Carlson, Anon, 2013. Um, I guess I could find it all in my blog, but let's just see if I can find all the games here. Um, let's go for the game that Carlson won as white. What you see in this game is he plays an unusual variation and then very quickly transposes into an endgame, right? So this is on move 14 or 15, he's trading into an endgame. It's not really clear why white would be better or why any particular, I mean, or, you know, why a player like me would ever want to play this kind of an endgame. Um, but, you know, it gets him a random end game that's, you know, somewhere between equal and a slight minute advantage for white. And then he can try and outplay his opponent in the end game. Carlson loves to do this. But the problem is, like, between, or the difference between this and the Berlin end game is that here, once you get into the end game, Anand's never seen this particular end game before, right? He has to come up with all his plans, all his piece placements, you know, what to do with his pawn structure. Should he play C5 or leave the pawn on C6? He has to make every choice for himself. It's just you know, all new territory. Whereas if you go into this Berlin endgame, um, over here, this endgame is like incredibly mapped out from here, right? So Anand already knows in advance, like the intricacies of this particular pawn structure here, where to put his pieces, you know, dozens of plans and has lots of moves like prepared out, right? And that's what Carlson like often or almost always <laughs> wants to avoid, right, is for his opponent to be able to play some free moves that they memorized at home. He likes to cut down on that as much as possible. Take away those free moves for the opponent where they get to play as well as the computer without having to think for themselves. So D3 takes us away from that and, um, you know, avoids, avoids that, postpones the resolving of the tension for later. And I think that is consistent um, or, you know, consistent with his style and, like, the best choice for him here. So, um, coming from that, the game develops up to this point, and here's where Carlson makes his first interesting choice, which is he chooses to make this trade on C6. Um, you know, which is just, like, just an option. It's not, like, good or bad. It's just, it's just a choice. Um, it was slightly surprising to me to see this move because often, you know, Black's going to spend a tempo on a6 or something. But I guess here, if he just plays a move like h3, he's probably thinking that Black's plan is to transfer this knight to the king side. I think that's why he went ahead and made the trade right away because Black wasn't going to play a6. They weren't going to play knight a5. They're just going to move the knight, and then. I mean, you could play bishop e3, or you could play, you know, some move for white. You could play c3 to be able to retreat this piece, right? And black's going to do something like this kind of a setup. So they transfer the knight over to the king side, support this pawn, right? It's the same as this maneuver for white. Black's already achieved pretty quickly here. And, uh, you know, black's position is, is quite comfortable, I would guess. Um... You have to keep in mind that I'm really bad at the Rui Lopez, so when I'm doing a video on a Rui Lopez game, uh, well, you know, the you have to take any opinion of any chess player with a grain of salt, um, but especially, you know, a medium strength player looking at an opening that they're bad at. Um, but I think that, you know, once Black's castled, which is the last move here right before Carlson trades on C6, I think this maneuver here probably makes sense as what Black would do next. And that explains why Carlson sort of goes ahead with the trade right away himself, preemptively. Um, and the trade just creates another kind of position, right? So now there's like the bishop pair for black, the b-file for black, and doubled pawns for white to try and take advantage of. So just introduces a couple little imbalances, doesn't resolve the game just yet, right? And you can play on from here. So h3 to take away bishop g4, so then in some case he could maybe play d4. Um, he could have also just played knight d2, I'm pretty sure, because I don't think the move order matters too much here because on bishop g4, h3 would be good for white. 
Um, maybe he didn't want to give Black a chance to play F5 very easily. That could be a reason for throwing an H3 sooner. Um, because with this solid, with this structure, um, you don't really want to advance D5 as much past these pawns. Um, it's nice to try and keep this structure as solid as possible. So if you want to try and pry something open, uh, you would tend to want to open the light square diagonals for your bishop. You would want to trade this pawn. You would want to want to open this file. I think this would make sense for black. Looks like a pretty good option. So maybe he has to play H3 first. I'm not sure. Rook D8. Develop. Develop. Oh, yeah. That's not developing. Sorry. Um, I'm not really clear in this next like two or three moves what what Anon's kind of plan was with rook to e8 and knight to d7. It seems like over the course of these three moves, Anon sort of doesn't do very much. Um, and yeah, I mean, I don't know if there's something that he should be doing. Um, I still like the plan of f5. So one thing I might consider would be like king h8, knight g8, f5. Um, but maybe he maybe he wants to deal with Carlson possibly playing d4. Like maybe if this, then d4 takes, takes. And now this isn't a position where you're ever playing f5, right? Because you don't even have the strong e5 pawn anymore. Um, so maybe the idea with rook to e8 is dissuading Carlson from playing d4, which is, you know, a logical possibility after h3. Um, another possibility would be to just tuck the bishop on b6 here. That's a play, playable move as well. I don't know. I'm not sure what all the plans are, I'm sure, but I but I suspect that there's some latitude of options here. Um, this is exactly the kind of position where I'm kind of at c. Um, I, I know what Carlson's maneuver here is, right? He's putting the knight in position so that he can trap this bishop if he wants to. And he's also putting pressure here to make it hard for black to play either d5 or f5 um, by having this attack on the e5 pawn if his e4 pawn can trade. So, um, yeah, there's also like a minor threat here of knight a5 and... Black would have to play knight b8. I don't know if it would really matter too much, but he could possibly go for that. Um, should be six, a4. So he just wants to go a5 as well, take, take space away. This move is pretty strong in a lot of these Rui Lopez's where they've got the shattered pawns over here because what you want to try and set up as white is some kind of like positional blockades, things like that. Um, you know, limit your opponent's bishops from getting to open diagonals. Um, and also, if possible, make these three pawns advance. Uh, sorry, make this pawn advance because it's an isolated pawn. Um, to a lesser extent, make these pawns advance because these pawns are a little bit better when they're ahead of this pawn than, they were, than when they're behind it. So to some extent, advancing them isn't terrible sometimes, but in general, the more he can make these the more you can make someone's pawns advance when they're a bit weak, very often the the weaker they become. So that could definitely be uh, something here. So black plays a5 to stop white from playing a5, and there you go. That's like a little bit of a target that you could do something with. Um, Carlson doesn't choose to do that, but I mean, you could imagine someone putting their bishop on c3 here, right? Just keeping black tied to this. No counterplay on the B file while they're defending. Um, and then maybe at some point go for D4 from there. Um, or even Queen D2 and really pile up on, on A5. Seems like a possible plan. But Carlson's happy to just trade off that bishop now. And he straightens out Anand's pawn structure. But he's able to follow up immediately with D4. And we see that Anand's pieces are just slightly passive compared to Carlson's just just a smidge um and he's made a couple extra little pawn moves on the queen side which could still provide some weakness there so there's like the potential for white to be a tiny bit better but you know he's traded in the doubled pawn and the bishop pair so to some extent 
He's just gotten rid of the imbalances and made the position closer to equal. Um, however, the position still has some imbalance because of these opposite colored bishops. And opposite colored bishops often make end games more drawish and middle games more winnish. So if you can set up some kind of attack on, I don't know, a square like d6, it's harder for black to deal with it. And there's there's whole ways of creating attacks largely on the dark squares when your opponent doesn't have a dark square bishop and you do. And vice versa for black to try and set up stuff on the light squares. Anyway, d force played. Um, and I'm going to assume black wasn't... I had assumed that black was not in position to counter with d5, but I didn't even look at it. So we can... We can just double check that for fun just to show that the position's not completely equal in, in terms of this tension. D5. Um, let's see what I could do here. Could take here. Then if black takes back, white wins a pawn. So black can try E4. And then I could try taking here if I want to end up ahead of pawn. Takes, check here, takes with a good threat. He should take it back. Um, it's got two different ways to take it back. I don't know which one is correct. Let's just go with one of them. And white is already ahead one pawn, and if he takes here, he's up two pawns, but allows this check. Um, well, so if white has to just play a move like bishop e3 or bishop f4 here, and then takes, you go into some position like this, then this is a hard extra pawn to try and convert, because your king's weak and the opponent's light squared bishop can get pretty strong. I mean, you can even be worse ahead of pawn if the opponent is able to generate attacks using the opposite colored bishop. If white could take here, now he's up two pawns, and if he can play b3, bishop b2, he's pretty close to winning. So, you know, this would be a whole a whole other question. Um, which, you know, I just don't know the answer off the top of my head here. Maybe another option, knight to g5, attacking e4, and then when they take queen h5. I wonder if black can defend both of these. A little double attack. Well, that looks clear. Black can't defend both of those. So, you know, something like prevent queen h7 at least, because that's more like checkmate. Check here. And um, whites up a healthy extra pawn. So... Looks good for white. So anyway, Carlson advances d4 quickly, puts some pressure here, and black seems to be slightly on the worst side of the tension in the center. Um, as largely because they have the more passive knight versus the more active knight that's like attacking things versus defending things. Um, so... Anon plays queen c7, just defending his e5 pawn better. And yeah, I mean, at this point, there's not yet anything to be really excited about. There's no really good square for this bishop, which is really the problem that that plagues me most of all in the Rui Lopez. Like, one of the reasons that I'm one of the worst Rui Lopez players in the world is that this bishop just tortures me. I never know what to do with him. Like, when you play bishop g5, it's always, you know, too early, too bad, like... You get in trouble, they play h6, and you don't know what to do. If you leave it on c1, then your pieces are never coordinated. So this piece just drives me crazy in the Rui Lopez. I, I absolutely hate it. Um, and I've seen some Carlsen games where he's had the same problem as me. I've seen him play some games with bishop g5, h6, bishop h4, g5, and sort of get in trouble with that bishop. I even heard other grandmasters... Um, make some commentaries here and there that like one of Carlson's weaknesses in the Rui Lopez, which you have to take this comment with a grain of salt, given that he's like the Rui Lopez is his favorite opening and he's probably the best Rui Lopez player in the world right now. But his weakness 
in the in his best opening is that he sometimes plays bishop g5 at, at the wrong time or too soon. So I wonder if he has a little bit of the same, you know, worry or concern as me that it just drives him crazy to have his bishop sitting on c1 and he's just anxious to try and find something to do with it. Um, anyway, it would be great if there were something to do with the bishop here. Then white would be super happy. Um, you know, maybe b3, bishop b2, an unusual thing to do with that bishop, but that could be a thing to do with it here. The problem is if we eventually play d, e, d, e, that pawn might just be rock solid and the bishop won't be as good. Um, if we play bishop e3, then after pawn takes, our rook isn't defending e4. Um, but if we went for trade, trade, bishop e3 might be the best square for the bishop aiming at this. So it's not yet clear what to do with the bishop. And I love the solution that Carlson came up with here. I don't know how often this move works, but it definitely works here. And that is rook to a3. And he finds a way to use the rook without moving the bishop. And he doesn't have you know, another bishop that he's retreated to b1, so he doesn't have, like, the rook totally trapped in, but, and he doesn't have a pawn on c3, like in a lot of Rui Lopez lines, so I'm guessing this doesn't come up that often in the Rui Lopez, but here, it's just beautiful and sweet. I mean, there's all kinds of things he can do with it. He can attack these two pawns from one of these two squares, right? He could contest the d file from this square, or if he plays knight to g5, he can, you know, follow up with an attack with queen h5 and rook g3. So this rook is fantastic here. And to be honest, the only reason that I always want to move my, my C1 bishop in the Rui Lopez is because I want my A1 rook to be in communication with the rest of my position. And here, Carlson solves the problem of the rook, and so he can just leave the bishop on C1. Um, and it's no problem at all. The bishop is fine on this square. In the Rui Lopez, I mean, you, often I think of bishop B5 as just being a way to castle kingside. And when I play bishop g5 or bishop e3, it's usually just to be able to move this guy. So this game here, um, totally according to my taste. White manages to use the rook and leave the bishop here. Perfect. Now, um, Anand is just trying to like coordinate his position, but I never really, never really see in this particular game any kind of real plan emerging for black. Um, but I'm also not sure exactly what plan would be would be great for black. He has the same problem that it's not clear what to do with this bishop, right? But he also would like to coordinate this rook and get it in the center at least so it can deal with some of what this rook might be able to do. But this rook will have a lot more options actually than a black rook on d8, which will just fight for control of this file. But there are many situations where even though there's one open file, it's not that critical. Basically, it's based on whether or not you're able to control the penetration square. So actually, let me just go ahead two moves here to show you a position with the file open, since that's what we get this game anyway. So this pawn covers d3, this bishop covers d2, and this knight covers d2, and the knight also covers d4, and d1 is guarded successfully by these pieces. So black doesn't have any way to penetrate on the d file, so the D file is not going to be of huge value for black. At least there's not like obvious proactive plans for using it. Something similar can be said for white that they can't penetrate on D7 at all. It's pretty well covered. Um, D8 is also covered pretty easily. D6 is the one possible vulnerability. Like if white could get a piece into D6 and sort of attack these pawns from the side, that might be like a nice idea for white. So, but you know, the importance of these files often depends on whether or not there's a penetration point from which you can then, you know, attack things from the side or start to control important squares and deprive your opponent's pieces of those squares. Um, so, so anyway, so, so Anand with knight f8, I think, is like at least trying to get the knight out of the way of these pieces. So his knight could go to g6 to defend this square instead of d7. Um... Or it could go to e6, possibly, and then it could aim at these two squares, which are like minor weaknesses for white in terms of how he set up his pawn structure, but his bishop covers them, so they're not like horrible problems. But anyway, so that's what he's doing, just sort of coordinating a little bit better with the knight and bishop and, you know, thinking maybe to just tuck the bishop here and, and connect his rooks, um, depending on how Carlson 
plays it. And now Carlson um, does something perhaps slightly surprising, which is he resolves the tension in the center right away. Um, I guess the reason is he didn't really have any further plan that he wanted to do with this tension. Um, if I try and think of like what else he could do here, you know, he could maybe play rook d3, try and increase tension a little bit, maybe b3, bishop to a3, aiming at that one weak square. Could be one idea for trying to keep the tension a little bit longer. Um, but what he goes for is to start transferring pieces to the king side. And if he's going to transfer pieces to the king side, then he's ready to resolve the center. Again, it's not going to look like he has very much at first when he just trades into the symmetrical position, right? It feels like, well, pretty close to equal. Like the weak squares for each side are these squares here that they could try and bring their knights in, but each player has that covered with their bishop, so they can always trade it off. There's no big weaknesses for either player. There's an open file for the rooks to trade on. It doesn't seem like there's that much going on, but there is still a slight edge for white. And what that's based on is it's based on which player gets their queen into this area of the board first. Um, Black's queen, having moved here, has lost control of this area. And without a knight on f6 to keep the white queen at bay, Carlson is able to quickly transfer two pieces into the king side. And there was no good way to keep them out. So now Anand is just at a little bit of a disadvantage in terms of being able to contest the squares on the king side or have the same degree of power on the king side as Carlson has. And you can see that Carlson has more pieces that are able to get in there. Um, the power of having a rook here and a queen here and a knight here is going to make a move like bishop h6 a possible move, whereas bishop h3 is not, it's not really on a non's radar here. So sometimes... Okay, so imagine this position that black had a queen on d8. If you play queen h5, you keep your opponent from playing queen g5 or queen h4. If they play queen h4, they keep you from playing queen g4 or queen h5. There's a lot of situations with this e4 versus e5 center where the first person to bring their queen to the king side can actually gain a noticeable advantage just off of that one move and that one idea. Um just that they gain some control of that space with their queen and then the opponent can't bring their queen into that space themselves. And then, you know, they can sort of build up a little bit from there. So even though it looks pretty close to equal, um, white still has a nice little advantage in this position. Um, yeah. So knight f5 here. Um... So he shows himself willing to just allow that that trade, right? Um, we also have to calculate the move g6 for a second here. I'm pretty sure it doesn't do anything good for black. So rook here. I mean, well, the reason that you wouldn't want to play g6 is you're weakening yourself, right? And in particular, you're weakening your dark squares, which for black is the squares that he's weak on. So after something like rook g3, king here, Queen h4 avoids losing a piece because of checkmate. Um, and from here, g6 hasn't you know, won a piece, and therefore it's just a pure weakening move here, pretty much. Um, yeah, black's not in good shape. So knight f5 comes. Um, Anon just sits tight with bishop e6. Uh, let's say he takes here. Would Carlson take with his queen or his pawn? Something I'm not even sure about after playing through the game. Um, in general, I would prefer taking with the queen, but maybe black can just counter with queen d7 and go towards an endgame. I wonder if white has enough to, to actually bother the opponent here. Maybe now aim at this square. Yeah. 
use the position of this rook to try and generate a weakness. So all of black's pawns have kind of landed on squares where white's bishop can attack them. On the other hand, black's still pretty solid and controls this file, which is definitely of some value here, right? Like white's not able to make use of this rook because black controls this. If white could somehow play rook d3 with this rook, he would now either win the b pawn or gain control of the d file and things would get really bad for black. If I could play this, you know, rook takes, rook takes, and my rook can come into d6. This knight's limited. These pawns are under fire. That's like possibly a winning advantage for white, but there's no way that I see to really get good use out of this rook here. Um, maybe we can go rook d1, rook d2, and then still try and keep these pawns under fire. Yeah, I mean, we allow this, but it's not like white can't do anything themselves here, right? Interesting. It seems like white is still the one pressing in that endgame, right? Once we come up with the idea of actually using our, using our second rook, it feels like black's at a bit of a disadvantage in terms of trying to defend these pawns while white is actually able to find a way to use all the pieces. Um, and this knight, we don't want to play knight d7 when white can play rook d2 and then rook d3. So, you know, he has to do something active with this rook first, probably. Then, then he could either go after a4 or he could just bring out his knight, play here, here, here. But it looks like white's going to get control of the d-file in this scenario if he wants to. Maybe black can just control that with his king coming up. That could be enough of a solution to, to maybe hold out, get a draw here. But white's definitely better. I mean, the rook and bishop tend to coordinate a little bit better than the rook and knight, and we've got ample targets to go after. We have f4 to eventually break open some more diagonals for this piece. We can bring our king to e4, and black has to defend the light squares against our king coming in, which is a little bit tricky. And this rook actually still has just great maneuvering on the third row. So it seems like white would be a little bit better even if black first traded off this knight and then traded off the queens. I mean... Maybe that's a way to, to hold a draw. Maybe, you know, he should go for that. But um, definitely a little bit worse there, so I can understand why he wouldn't just go for that. Um, oh, yeah, I'd meant to talk about this move, and then I, and then I forgot um, for a second and went ahead. I wanted to just discuss this move for one second, F6. This is a little tiny move that people play very often and see as like a harmless move. It's just solidifying this. I've got a light squared bishop, so I'm putting pawns on dark squares. All my pieces can move around and through this structure. So it's often played just thoughtlessly by players like myself um, and other people. You know, just, oh, I defend this pawn. Now my pieces are freer. I don't have to worry about covering this pawn. The thing to remember about this move is that it's a weakness. Like basically every little pawn move creates some little weakness. And moving F pawns tends to weaken the second rank and to weaken king positions. Now, it's only slightly, and you can see hundreds of thousands of Grandmaster games where a move like F6 is played because it does have positives. And the black player never pays for playing that move, right? His pieces move around, they stay active around the structure, and nothing ever develops, and that's fine. But um, the thing that, that, that I do and that other people probably do is to play this move thoughtlessly, and I think that can be a little bit of a mistake. In other words, what I think you want to do as white, uh, sorry, as black when playing a move like this is keep in mind what the downside of the move is. Right, just keep track of what your moves do, what their pluses and minuses are, and don't just forget about them. Right, so you play f six, you know, oh yeah, it's like helping me, you know, 
defend e5 and keep my pieces active and have good squares for all my pieces and it's like a fine structure overall yes but this is a fine structure overall as well right so when you play f6 be aware that there's a little bit of a downside to that move okay just keep that in mind that you know your second rank could become weak at some point that you know it yeah, I mean, you don't even have to be like worrying about it all the time. You just have to sort of have this awareness and knowledge that that is a factor to the move, okay? And this is one of those rare games where this weakness actually comes to fruition. So if you're wondering what I'm talking about, how this is a weakness, you will see and understand as we go through the game. So I'm not going to like argue about it now in theory. I'm just going to show you with an example, a Carlson example. Um. But yeah, we want to just like keep these little things in mind as we go along. So um, here we see one of White's first threats of the game. I guess the other one was to trap that bishop with a5 and b4 or something. But one of White's first threats of the game, and it is to take on g7. Black uh, counters it without weakening his pawn structure with knight to g6. So if we look at the number of pieces that white has on the king side versus black, we can see just based on number of pieces that there's some potential for white to have a king side attack, right? We've got these three attackers versus these two defenders and these pawns. We have a reserve attacker and possibly a second reserve attacker. Um, Black's queen provides some defense, but she's not like very like agile and mobile in defense for the moment and neither of black's rooks are defenders at the moment so white definitely has the potential to attack on the king side and here he brings in another little little fighter to just try and continue increasing the attacker versus defender count and this little guy could get up to h5 could get up to h6 could do some kind of uh damage to uh the black king position the closer he gets, the more valuable he becomes as sort of an extra attacker. And uh, here, Anand finally decides to resolve things with a couple trades. But after all these trades, he's definitely a little bit worse. Um, in this resulting position of two rooks and a queen versus two rooks and a queen. It definitely diffuses the first wave of White's attack, right? He trades off two of White's possible attackers, chases this piece away from the king side, and opens a second file so that, you know, you don't want your pieces committed over here as much. You really need to cover the center of the board. So he diffuses the first wave of White's attack completely, but he remains a little bit, uh, but he definitely remains worse in this position. White's queen is still more active than his by controlling this square. Black's king's a little bit weak on the second row because his f-pawn has moved and White's hasn't. Um, and he's opened the e-file for White, which will counter the d-file that he has. And finally, this rook still has some interesting options to harass Black's pawns or to maybe double rooks. So he remains worse here. So let's go back a little bit and see if there was a better way for Black to defuse this attack as it was incoming starting from queen h5 here by white. Let's just see if we can try one or two things. So one thought would be maybe to pass on this f6 move, right? Like maybe we could just go knight to g6. See if he wants to trade. Um, if white trades on g6 and we play h takes g6, um, it changes the structure a little bit. It's got its advantages and disadvantages. Um... But overall, I feel like it kind of like is not a bad trade for black. So let's imagine that Carlson's plan probably was to keep this piece on the board in a little bit more tension and go with knight f5. So now he could still follow up with rook g3, h4, h5, h6, maybe even bishop h6 in some case, um, going after the g7 square. So how do we want to play this position as black? Um... You know, maybe without f6, maybe without bishop f5, ef5. Um, how else would we want to defend this position? Because the way I'm playing, you know, I haven't made this any worse for white, right? Um, if anything, I've made it worse for black because there's f6 in some case quickly. And you don't get the tempo on this rook here. And maybe white just plays f6 and hurts the king's position. 
So, you know, I'm not really looking to just emulate the same plan that, that Anand already did. I want to try something, something else here. So is there any way to bring a similar amount of defensive reserves and forces to the king side as white has incoming right here? Well, I don't, frankly, I frankly don't see it. I mean, you can, you can cover things a little bit with the rook on the second rank. You could play f6 to like cover a few squares, but in no case are you ever bringing as many pieces to the king side with as much, uh, with as much control there as white. So, um, it seems like black's definitely going to be suffering from some possible attack ever since white got his queen into the king side. So then the next question is, well, is there any kind of counterplay, any way to sort of sap, um, to sap white's attacking forces in time using this D file, which so far in no variation that we've played through has that file really mattered. So, all right, let's try and double rooks on that file and see if it does anything for us, shall we? Let's bring another piece over for white. And now let's start doubling rooks. Okay. Um, so my plan is to go here and then hopefully to play rook d1, but even that is still covered. So I'll have to sort of figure out how I want to do that once I get there. Um, oh yeah, I remember another cool idea I, I had. So I have to remember to get to that next. Okay. So we're going for rook d8, but it's still not even clear how we're then going to threaten anything or get any kind of counterplay. Um, now let's imagine that white plays bishop to h6 here, trying for an attack. Takes, queen takes, threatening checkmate, f6, another sack, sure, why not? All right, I'm going to defend with the rook here. Give white the chance to go into an end game where he's only down a bishop versus two pawns. Um, white could also go for this. But it doesn't feel like, uh, it doesn't feel like white has quite enough for a rook, although it's not like completely lost for white. It does have four pawns for a rook already once he takes here. Um, but perhaps not quite good enough yet. So maybe add the H pawn first, right? So that gives us the extra, the extra body. And then on rook d8, we're going to try bishop h6. So now if black takes and we take, taking, taking, loses back the piece. Um, f6, h5 also loses back the piece. Uh, he can try and sort of trade off some of what white's got here. But it looks like at the end, white's going to have a strong attack of these two pieces against this king. Uh, the only defense I could imagine at this point is trying to play queen g7 to trade off white's uh, queen at least. Um, but I imagine we just keep our queen. We're still winning this piece, taking here, and then eventually trying to find some other way to get our queen in. But meanwhile, black's king should be under serious pressure here, and black's probably going to be down a pawn as well after white's taken on g6. So... Again, it looks pretty grim for black. Um, so once I get here, you kind of have to defend this square. And I've got you know, an attack going for white. So maybe f6 to defend the square that way. Um, so queen g4 maybe going for h5. But black, let's see, how, how good or bad is this situation? Let's just try out a few things. Um, let's try taking on g7 just to make sure that it's not good. I'm 
just trying to play h5 and win this piece. Is there any way out of that? I guess there's h5 for black, right? Technically avoids h5 by white, but then takes, and they're still threading this piece, king here. Now white has two pawns and a rook against the two pieces, so that's already quite a bit. And black's still under some pressure. I mean, kind of tied up. So maybe rook d1 or rook h8 there. Let's get rid of this problem. It's definitely a bit of a weird situation here. Playable. Black can also take with the king here um, so that it's not two pieces. So h5 is not as big a threat and he doesn't have to play h5 himself after a move like queen f3, he could try to play king f7, right? And then the knight can move to f4. Um, that might be fine for black. So I, I, my feeling is knight takes g7. That wasn't looking like it's good for white just yet. Um, what I'd like to do is play h5 and the queen's in the way. So let's try this move queen g4 here. Um, so still takes h5 is not what I want to do as black because it's opening up the power of these pieces. No, what I'd like to do if possible is like land knight f4 at some point and just trade enough off, but wonder if I can do that. King h8, h5, knight f4, check. That's a problem for black, check. And white has won a pawn, I guess. So moving the king didn't help because it made that that into check. Um, what else can I do? I can't really move the rook anywhere. Can't really move anything. Can I trade here to take one defender off, one attacker off of that square, and then play this myself? Yeah, black can do that. Seems reasonable. Um, this versus the way it was played in the game, black's actually in better position to immediately get counterplay uh, if white trades on f4 like in the game, right? And then you could play rook c3 or rook f3 or something, but immediate counterplay for black. Maybe I just defend this pawn. I don't know exactly, but this position looks looks a bit better for black than what happened in the game, right? Immediately trading off a piece, getting getting pretty active in the center with queen e5 maybe. I mean, f6 is still a little bit of a weakness, but that feels a bit better for black to me than what we did last time. Um, the other thing you could do for white here would be rook e3. So the idea is to trade and then immediately get in with the rook. But let's say black then keeps his knight. White's not really making any serious threats here, and this knight is pretty good. So... I don't know. This might be a slightly better way to do it for black. Just quick developing of all these pieces like this. Um, all right. Second thing I want to suggest that black can possibly do in a position like this. Instead of a move like that, a move that will tend to generate counterplay that people might be loath to do because it's sort of like Positionally, it's like weakening to trade a more central pawn for an A pawn, right? Like if white makes this trade and then plays knight to d5 and his pieces were centralized, right, you would never want to make that trade for the A pawn. But here, since white is already sort of committed over here, 
you're not in danger of white crushing you in the in the center from this slight side tracking of your pawns and in fact it generates one counterplay two counterplays the possibility of an outside pass to a pawn so and it's just a way of opening another part of the board to give white something else to worry about um and if white does nothing yeah you can take this pawn from him i don't know that it, it's gonna crush him but you're doing something at least right or if he plays b3 you can trade um and then go here and here and now you're attacking some things at least I mean, it almost seems like white would be better off just letting black have this pawn. Um, but, you know, even there, black can generate some some counterplay. He can get his rook out. He could play a3 and rook to b1, or he could play rook to b4. And, you know, it, do, it does something. So this is like the other way to play a position like this that I can think of is like, if you don't have counterplay on the d file, which I think in general you don't have very much, and you don't have a way to bring as many pieces to the king side as white, so you have no way to eventually avoid some little concessions over here, such as the move f6. Then one thing you can do is you can play this move b5 once white's fairly committed to the king side, and just try and develop some counterplay on that side of the board. So, kind of a kind of an option to keep in mind. Um, I've seen it used before in in some e4 e5 games. All right. Well, with that, let's get back to the game and see how, how Carlson prosecutes the advantage that he did get here, because it's quite instructive. So he brings the H pawn, and Anand goes for this trade of all the minor pieces. And now we get this position where Carlson has a little advantage because of the activity of his queen and the slight weakening of black along the second row. First move he plays is rook c3. And this is a pretty sweet move because he actually wants to make black. Like, he wants to keep Black from coordinating his rooks as fast by making annoying threats onto these two pawns. So, ideas here include rook e6, aiming at them, queen f3, suddenly attacking this pawn and this pawn. So, just trying to get in touch with all these weaknesses. Um, if you answered rook e6 with c5, then, you know, maybe he would go rook b3 and he'd really be on this pawn. So, just a little something that Anand really has to worry about. And, uh, and at the same time, it's hard for Anand to challenge this rook e6 thing because the queen is covering e8, right? So keep in mind that this blunders a rook and leads to checkmate, and that similarly, this move, covering his weaknesses, looking to double rooks, and controlling the weakness on e6, also leads to rook e8 and the same checkmate, okay? So yes, it would be much slicker to be defending these penetration points by d doubling your own rooks, but the threat of rook e8 checkmate actually costs black a little bit in this uh, in this in this scenario or this game. I mean, he could try and deal with it by taking move to play h6 so that this isn't checkmate. Um, it could still be an unpleasant penetration, but probably at some point he does want to get rid of the checkmate. But it'll still cost him a tempo, you know, during which time Magnus will attack those pawns, right? So, for example, if you play h6 here. He could play queen f3 attacking this, c5, rook to e4, and uh, that pawn appears to be a goner, right? All right, now let's see if I can even still find what he actually did in the game. Yep, I think I found the game. So in the game, after rook c3, he goes for c5 immediately. It's like a move that he's not going to be able to do without because Carlson can just attack c6. So he spends a tempo on that. Carlson comes to e6 anyway. Um, so now this rook is in strong position because it's attacking b6, so the queen has to stay on that. And it's also allowing the queen to get behind it, which she couldn't before when the rook was on e1. So rook a b8 here, a little bit of a sad move, right? Not what you want to be doing with this rook. Defending this, so he's got more options with the queen, maybe thinking of going to queen f7. And now this rook needs to be improved, very obviously, because it's just biting on this pawn. And uh, the options are b3, f3, and c4. Right? You should look at this pawn or this pawn. And the rook goes this way. And the reason it goes after this instead of this, for one thing, this pawn's a little bit further away from black's pieces, harder for them to defend than this one. 
But for a second, this gives you the second option of going all in on the E file, which Rook F3 and Rook B3 don't do because Black's got E3 controlled. It's one of the nice things about this pawn as long as it lasts. But here, White's looking to play Rook E4 at some point or Rook F4. And Black is like really, really under the gun here. Um, not really... You can really see how black should defend this position. It's pretty unpleasant with like the rooks and just the weakness on this file and this pawn. So plays queen d7, looking for a queen trade. So don't cash in for too little when you've got a nice position. Check, queen trade, check, here, rook here. And uh, this is not an easy end game to, to try and do anything with as white. So Carlson plays king h2, getting out of the way of queen d1 check. And this is just a slick tactical trick. If black goes queen d1, still just trying to get, trying to maybe force a queen trade, get his queen involved, start looking at some of white's weaknesses. White has a tactic here to win. Do you see what it is? Yeah, classic tactic, rook e8 deflecting that rook from defending the queen. Whoops, didn't get her. There we go. So king h2, the king gets off of this rank. It's just getting out of this move being check. Um, but this king in this kind of a pawn structure here with white's queen already in position, whereas black's isn't on this side of the board, this king could sometimes be safe on you know, slightly more random or more exposed squares like h2 or h3 than you would normally expect. That's not what black played. All right, rook f8. So this is looking to the possibility of like rook f7 to defend against rook e7 or to playing rook to e8. Now, why doesn't black just play rook to e8 here? Let's just check on that. So white doubles threatening to win the game right away on e8. So the only consistent move, if we want a rook e8, it wasn't to then run away, it's to trade. So let's give white a passed pawn. And now, if I blockade it as black, I'm just losing this pawn for free after queen f5. So this pawn's now defended and we can take this with our queen or rook next move. So black's down a pawn and it's actually like kind of annoying past pawn. That's not an easy one to surround and capture actually here. Um, if I keep the queen more like active trying to do something or other, white just queens the pawn right away and this check doesn't matter because that queen will, will end the game. So... I think here, yeah, I mean, the best you can do is blockade it, queen f5, lose a pawn, and continue to suffer because this one's a pretty strong pawn. Um, I don't see a good way to put up, to put up like a strong resistance there for black. I mean, I guess that's like a, a lost endgame and rules out rook to e8 pretty much which means already here rook c3 rook e6 rook e4 white's gained control of the e file now the difference between white's control of the e file and black's control of the d file which he had from the moment that we traded into this right from the moment that we traded into here we had this file black has this file or i guess we're not in the game carlson has the e file anon has the d file what's the difference well the difference is largely that pawn on f6 it means that when white penetrates to the second rank, he's threatening checkmates right away, right? Queen f7, queen g7, or if black plays rook f8 to stop queen f7, you know, queen g4 could still threaten in checkmate. If black plays queen d2 in these positions, it doesn't do as much. I mean, it may threaten like a pawn or two on the second row, but it doesn't create mating threats against white's king because white still has this pawn sort of blocking off that row. Um... Right, so um, one of the reasons for that is the F pawn moving, weakening the second row. The other is the more active position of the queen, still leading to more threats against black's king than against white's king, just because of the position of the queens. And if you imagine white's queen on, I don't know, like E4, 
and black's queen on h5, then you would see that the black king would be under like slightly less threats and black would have some counter threats against white off of the position of their queen. So that can definitely be seen as like a, the, the second factor that leads to this imbalance between the value of the two files. Um, so black plays rook f8 and Carlson doubles and that's a threat. He wards it off like this. Um, the other threat is to just take the pawn on f4 at some point here, right? And then come back and keep doing this stuff. Um, so rook b7 is played. Looks like a possible opportunity for Carlson to take the pawn on f4, but it allows queen d2 with maybe some counterplay for black, right? Aiming at this and this and this. We do have to keep track that black does have this file in there. You know, if we're not threatening checkmate, then winning pawns for black would be enough counterplay to ward off what we're doing. So attack this. If we come here, then queen here. And now the king's starting to get a little bit vulnerable and the queen's in contact with some, with some checks. Very, very much looking like black can get a draw off of the now weak position of white's king. Uh, if instead we just keep everything defended, well, we're not making any mating threats or anything, black grabs their chance to get a little bit of counterplay and, you know, maybe maybe holds on there. So no rush to, to grab this weak pawn. I mean, it's not such a rush that you would want to let black get counterplay. And instead, Carlson plays queen e2. So now he switches the queen's position. Looking at b5, looking at e7. Really, really dominating this file. And uh, black played b5 here, trying to get rid of one of the weaknesses that white was attacking. I don't really know what, I don't really know that black had anything good that they could do here. I mean, to me, this pawn is already a goner. White can, you know, even win it with his king if he wants for style points. Um, It looks like he's winning it for free at this point, right? Because he's covered off black's counterplay. Black's pieces aren't doubled on this file because this rook's defending the seventh rank. This rook's defending the eighth rank. They don't have time to be looking down at white's at white's weak ranks so this pawn's basically dead at this point and black doesn't have any counterplay so they try and trade off a weakness and maybe open something on the other side of the board well i mean i doubt there's anything better than that um carlson just plays b3 to defend it um so now they each have these pawns which are all weaknesses for each of them but you know an equal degree of weaknesses, whereas before black played b5, it was just black who had one weakness and white had none. But since white's pieces are more active, you know, maybe more weaknesses is just as important. White can attack these things. Um, anyway, I think this is, you know, about all you can do as black, right? He's trying not to just give this away for free and then let white keep twirling around and doing what they want. So he gets at this, tries to trade off some of white's firepower and goes after this. Rook to e7. So um, black doesn't trade rooks here because just lets white bring in this queen into good position. Um, and after you move the queen here, for example, there's like a couple things white can do here. Um, let me see. I guess one would be just coming back here. No, that's what allows queen d4. Just a second. So queen c4, queen f7. This one possibility I remember thinking, but I think it didn't work because, yeah, black can actually take it, and then when you check, come back. Um, let's see. Queen e6, getting this past pawn is one option, leaving the rook on the on the seventh rank. Um, so you still got the absolute seventh rank, which means you're trapping their king. Absolute seventh means a seventh rank that the opponent can't counter, right? Black has no opportunity to play rook f7 and try and force you off of it here. Um, and so there's two good ideas for white. One is to bring up the king and take this pawn. Um can then also continue on to support this to try and queen. Another thing that white could randomly do at some point is just put his rook on this square or this square and take these pawns from behind. Um, 
my sense of technique, which again is another weakness in my game, but be that as it may, my sense of technique is to bring the king in here before moving your rook off to attack these pawns and maybe letting these pieces out. This actually looks probably good enough to win to me. Um, yeah. It looks probably good enough to win to me to just go for that end game. Let's see, if we don't go for that ending, what about this move? Does this, does this win also? F3, G3 deals with that check. Um, rook F7 is not possible. Can any piece get here? No. Okay, well, that was an easier win than queen E6 check, huh? Okay, so he didn't trade on E4 because it would allow basically an instant win. Um, I could go here trying to cover this queen move, um, but, you know, white can win this pawn for free and, and keep, keep working on this. He's got queen C4. He can attack these pawns. So Anon just moves the queen. Now he plays queen f3. So again, he just wants this trade to happen, right? And then he's planning to play queen to b7 and attack here. And actually, that's how the game ended. Anon didn't really prevent it. Let's see. Check here. So he finally makes the trade. If he doesn't make the trade, Carlson's prepared to trade on b4 himself and play queen b7, right? That doesn't matter to him. It wins just the same. So Anon trades off one rook, but he's still in this position where this rook's dominating him and there's this threat. Um, if rook f7 here, instead of f3 check, he loses to this here, check here, and queen coming in here. And he just gets back rank mated. Uh, so having two ranks to defend, his rook can only defend one at a time up and down, and this rook can get to either powered up by the queen, weakness of the king, there's just no defense against it. Even though it looks like so close to an equal situation, it's a completely lost situation from this weakness of moving the f-pawn. So, you know, keep this game in mind as a reminder to you always to understand like what we're talking about with that little weakness of moving your f-pawn. Anytime you move your f-pawn, keep in the back of your mind that this is like one thing that could happen to you. Um, so f3, g3, h5, and then queen b7. Just He resigned because of rook g7 check, followed by checkmate. Um, do you have any move here that postponed it? Maybe, but it's really not going to matter. Let's think. Uh, queen d2 stops queen b7 because of the threat of checkmate. So then king g1 check and back up does nothing. So Carlsen was certainly planning to take this. And now, basically, white's plan is to play king g2 defending this and then queen b7. And I'd be surprised if Anand has a way to continue forestalling that, right? I mean, queen d2 prevented it for a move or two. Rook f7 is still going to lose to rook e8 check, rook f8, queen b3, right? Keep this in mind. He can basically never counter white. white's rook. Um, so he has to go stop this, and white's up a pawn now. I'm planning this. Yeah, I just don't see how to do it. And it's not like b7 is the only square white can go to, right? Like, let's say I take here and I play queen b2, stopping queen b7. Um, there's other ways for white to get into the seventh row with the queen, right? I mean, well, for one thing, queen g4 wins here, right? And then if rook f7, queen c4, with or without rook e8 check first. We can also go check here here threatening checkmate rook here rook here that looks like a win so yeah i mean there's no way for black to defend against the threats to g7 in this position and that is quite a sick win by carlson um so that's uh that's it for the analysis of that game tomorrow's a rest day so there's a day off for an on to think things through. Um, I saw a picture of Carlson online. He looked like he was in a pretty good mood after that game, as as you would expect. Um, really like a classic Carlson game with the, with the Rui Lopez, right? Getting a small advantage and just some evil pressing. 
Some of the nicest things about that game, the way he used the rook on a3 to leave his bishop on c1, just massing pieces on the king side, and how he executed the two rooks and queen versus two rooks and queen, like just the use of his rooks, like always like efficiently getting to the to the place where you put the most pressure on the opponent and tie his pieces down to his weak pawns um, was really sweet. I mean, he really made it look like the two rook and queen versus two rook and queen was a forced win. And that may not exactly be the case, but I definitely don't see a great way for Anon to defend that position. Maybe like h6 instead of rook to b8 to um, have gotten rid of the back rank mates. But a tough position that feels like a forced loss when you play against Carlson. And uh, early blood in this world championship. So yeah, excitement. I'm looking forward to more of these games. Fun so far. Uh, for now, that's all. See y'all later. Bye.